Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I have the pleasure to talk to you about functional groups. And functional groups are really, really significant in the study of organic chemistry because in addition to the fact that these carbon skeletons, if you've, if you've considered the previous video on organic chemistry, we talk a lot about how the d diversity of life is sort of ultimately rooted in the molecular architecture. And ultimately, the architecture, the diversity of molecules, results in the manifestation of diversity of phenotype and function. And so what we're getting into is the fact that, you know, you can only go so far with diversity with hydrocarbons. And so these functional groups, which is what our discussion will be about today, are these little attachments to the, fun to the parent molecule, if you will, the hydrocarbon, that give it its unique properties. So... These organic molecules are really important and they make up our whole body and it's these functional groups, these things that you stick on to the hydrocarbon that give that, the molecule its uniqueness. And so my analogy of this is one of my favorite toys, which is Mr. Potato Head, but I, I, I should say it's not always Mr. Potato Head because it could be Mrs. Potato Head because if you start off with the potato, you see that? It's sort of the parent molecule, the hydrocarbon. Hydrogens are not shown. And depending on what attachments you place onto the potato, it'll manifest into Mr. or Mrs. or you can have a mustache or it could have a purse. It could be angry eyes or it could have glasses or whatever the case may be. I think you're getting the point. These attachments are the functional groups right here. So these are the, these are the functional groups. And so this is the potato right here, this hydrocarbon. And if I were to stick an ear on it, I would stick something like this. I'd stick a hydroxide on it. And so this molecule would no longer be hydrophobic, but it would actually have a hydrophilic functional group, a hydroxide, because it would ca it's capable of hydrogen bonding with, say, water. And so this gives it its unique property right there. And so this is a discussion of the various functional groups that are significant in biological sciences. And again, they're the attachments, and they replace hydrogen atoms on the carbon skeleton. Now, the skeleton could be a straight change, or, or, or it could even be a cyclic, or it could be branching, whatever the case may be. But it gives it its unique properties. And so one of the things that I want to say about that is, if we had something like this, if I said the hydrocarbon was that going on like this, this fairly long hydrocarbon. And then I decided to include a functional group. I'll stay with that hydroxide functional group. If I did this, this is what we mean by the attachment. This is the functional group that, that I just put on right there, and that gives it its unique property. And so you're like, well, is it significant to put this together? It, it may or may not be, but sometimes we could represent the parent molecule as simply R which is a, a variable. And then we can say that the functional group coming off of the R is the hydroxyl, like that. And so that's how we represent this. So that, that's a possibility. You'll see that from time to time. So here's the parent mo molecule, or the R. And again, the functional groups that can come off of that are numerous. Like we could have a hydroxyl group coming off. We could have a amine group coming off, which is NH2. And so we'll be able to see different things. We can have a, a phosphate functional group. A phosphate functional group would be an oxygen and a phosphorus and a double bond oxygen, O minus and O minus, like this. This sort of ring of oxygen around the phosphorus. Okay, so this is what we're gonna do. I'm gonna introduce some of these functional groups to you and sort of kick around the properties. The thing is, is that they're, they're very, very significant. And you're like, well, you say so, but I really mean it because if you look down here and see this ring structure, there's four rings of carbon right here. Do you notice how um, this is identical to this down below? Well, the basic structure of a steroid is something like this, okay? And you could, varying the functional groups, you could make different kinds of steroid hormones. You could even have cholesterol, which isn't technically a hormone, but it's a steroid. But you can make 
cholesterol, or you could consume cholesterol, how about that, in your diet, and then you could rip off some of the functional groups and add some different functional groups, and what do you have? Over here, it, this is a female hormone, estrogen, right here because of that functional group right here, shown in pink, kind of fun for female. So this literally makes you a female lion if you have this hormone. And if you have a methyl group here and a, and a, um, a, key, a ketone over here coming off to the side, you would, have, you would be testosterone, you'd be a male lion. So in other words, you'd have this big mane, be very muscular, be very sleepy, and lie around and do very, very little, or you can be female, which is raise the children, hunt, and, and be very active for the family. And so functional groups are really important. So we're gonna go through uh, some of these critical ones that are important in the chemistry of life, with, which are hydroxyl groups, I've alluded to them before. Uh, carbonyls, which are really cool. Uh, carbonyls can be ketones. Carbonyl is just a double bond oxygen to the carbon uh, chain. So this, if a carbonyl was at the very end, like this, let me draw it in. If the carbonyl was like this, at the very end, it'd be considered to be an aldehyde. And if the carb double bond oxygen is in the center, it's a ketone. So we'll look at that. And then carboxylic acids, you would have something like this. You'd have a double bond oxygen OH coming off of it like that. And so this has acidic properties. The amino group would have a nitrogen like this coming off of it. This would be the amine. Sulfhydryl sort of speaks for itself. It would have a CSH coming off of it. And the phosphate group, I referred to it before, it would be the oxygen, phosphorus, double bond oxygen, and one, uh, two more oxygens over here, which are negative charged because they're, they're only a uh, single bond. And then the, the methyl group is CH3 running out of room right there. So those are our functional groups. So let's take a little walk through those functional groups and see what they can do. Well, I don't want to play favorites because all of them are very significant, but the hydroxyl group is very critical in biological sciences because it conveys polarity. The, you, you know this OH bond right here. This is where it attaches to the R, the parent, the parent group, but that you know that OH is significant because that's a polar covalent bond. And so wherever a molecule has an OH coming off of it, it means that it can form hydrogen bonds with water, which means it's very soluble, and water would adhere as well to this area. This happens to be two carbon with an OH hydroxyl group on it. It's actually called ethanol. It's an example of, a, of drinking alcohol. Like, why is it an alcohol? Well, in the old nomenclature, hydroxides were also known commonly as alcohol, so OH. And so you could have something like this. Um, anything with this hydroxyl group on it is considered to be an alcohol. Old, it's sort of old school, but it still applies. And so you can look at this. If you, if you know your nomenclature of organic molecules, you can go, all right, one, two would be ethanol, and then it would be propanol, and this happens to be butanol. So there's th four carbons and an all. So you put the suffix OL on it, so butanol, okay? And it's polar. And so this carbonyl group I mentioned before is consists of an oxygen that's, uh, of course, connected to the carbon skeleton uh, by a double bond. And so if the double bond oxygen is at the end of the molecule, right at the end, it's considered to be an aldehyde. And if it's in the center somewhere in the molecule or just in the middle, it's considered to be a ketone. I always remember this, it's slightly goofy because uh, this, at the end of the molecule reminds me of the letter A. I'm not sure if that's helping you out a little bit, but this is what, what it is. Here's the R group, the hydrocarbon over here, and here's the hydrocarbon going in both directions like this. So carbonyl, double bond oxygen. A examples of this, this is an important one, is acetone. Like this, you might be familiar with this compound, helps to remove nail polish. and. Uh, Propanol is an example of that. And so a carboxyl group, carboxyl group, or COOH, sometimes carboxyls are referred to as carboxylic acids. And that's, that's important. The, all of these functional groups are going to come up in, in further discussion of important biological molecules. But carboxylic acids, very important. So 
which why is it considered to be an acid because check it out like over here that c o o h do you see how it's c o o h it's not drawn exactly like that it's the double bond oxygen with the oh so all of this together is considered to be a carboxylic acid it's considered to be an acid in this form because as it turns out all of these electrons over here in that oxygen sort of make it favorable for this functional group to donate a proton and so something that donates a proton you may recall is acidic it have it's not a strong acid but nevertheless it's considered to be an acid and so when it when it donates that it, it becomes ionized in other words it loses a proton so therefore it's negatively charged so check it out you could say that a carboxylic acid is drawn like this you put an R in the COOH like that you can draw it like this or you could draw it like this which is the R group COO minus which represents this and so here you can see uh, acetic acid which is what we all know from like vinegar for example um, it's sort of a sour taste which is also characteristic of an acid we like this in our salad dressings and so uh, here it is this is acetic acid this is a carboxylic acid right there so it has uh, acidic properties because it can donate that and so again more of this uh, here's a carboxylic acid and again it's what gives vinegar as I was saying its sour taste and then it could it can donate a proton but what's interesting is it can also accept it because that acetate ion which is the negative the COO minus can also accept protons and then therefore convert over to, to acidic acid as well so that's that's kind of interesting so another important functional group is an amine or an amino group so these amines have the same sort of properties that those uh, carboxylic acids do but the opposite they they can act as a weak base and what I mean by that is uh, this NH2 which is the functional group NH2 can actually accept protons and so when it accepts a proton it become it's basic because it reduces the protons in solution and so it's considered to be a base and so when that happens, like if it's in a real acidic environment, it'll, it'll accept that and it'll become ionized and, and it'll be NH3+. Plus. And so where would you find amino groups? Well, you'd find them in, and so let's just cut to the most important thing, you'd find them in amino acids. And so these amines, in other places as well, so here's the most simple of the 20 amino acids glycine and I say it's most simple because here's the central carbon the central carbon here's a carboxylic acid coming off of it on the side and here's the amine group that's being highlighted I say it's the most simple of the 20 because the R group right here if you will is hydrogen so it happens to be glycine there's 20 different R groups here and those R groups are also considered to be functional groups of amino acids. And so let me just highlight this again. So here's the amino group. And again, it can be act as a base. If it's in an acidic environment, it'll, it'll readily absorb protons. And so it'll be, um, ion, it'll be an ion. It'll be NH3 plus ionized at this point. So it act, acts as a base. And so I want to emphasize this for a second. So here we have an amino acid. It's made up of one central carbon. So this is the carbon skeleton. So it's an, it's, there's only one, so it's alpha. So this is the alpha carbon. So it has a hydrogen coming off. And so what comes down below this is the various R's. And so in an amino acid, let's go like this, amino acid, there's going to be 20 different ones. And you can look those up. I'm going to make a separate podcast on on peptides or amino acids. I'm, I'll write that down too. Peptides are very, very significant because you link these together and you'll have a protein. So what comes off of it? What's coming off of it are these functional groups. So let's go with this. Let's go, um, let's, excuse me, let's go amino. Let's put the amino over here. So let's put, if you recall, an amino would be a nitrogen with two hydrogens like that. So there's the amino part. There's the functional group right there. So there's the amino. And then over here is your 
what's considered to be the acid, which is a C double bond oxygen OH. So that's the carboxylic acid. So that's an amino acid. So here's the acid right here. This is the acid part, the carboxylic acid, and this is the amino part. So it's an amino acid. It's a very simple molecule. And so there's 20 different ones. And what's What's significant is that if you put these amino acids together like this, they form a big chain. And, and so each single one is considered to be a monomer. You remember that term somewhere from your past, or maybe it's new? Monomer. But collectively, it's considered to be a polymer because there's many of them. And so amino acids can link together this way. What's interesting about that, if I might just for a second, if I have an amino acid, and I'll just draw, draw it in like this. Here's my amino acid, and here's my R coming off the side here. If I had one amino acid, and it was going to link to the carboxylic acid of the second one, like this, here's my alpha carbon, here's my amino over here, Okay, so here's the R group coming off, here's the R group coming off. What's interesting is when you attach one amino acid to another, how that happens is that you liberate, and I'll use a separate color, yellow, it'll liberate water. So water is removed, H2O. And so watch this, when water is removed, like that, let me get rid of it, like this. When water is removed, and I'll put it over here as water, H2O, then simply there's a connection there. Notice the, the nitrogen has three bonds and the what was once the carboxylic acid uh, now uh, is removed as well. And so this is considered to be a bond between the two and that would be called a peptide bond and water is released. So that's kind of neat. A peptide is bond is formed when an amino group and a carboxylic acid unite. And of course you need an enzyme to catalyze that because it's not energetically favorable. And so interestingly enough, if you recall that, uh, that chemical reaction making a peptide bond occurs on ribosomes. And it, ha it happens to be uh, RNA in the large subunit that catalyzes that peptide bond. Or pretty interesting, pretty interesting stuff. So, Here's another functional group, sulfhydryl, or SH. Sulfhydryl sometimes is called, the old name, and I say common name or name of the compound, um, an older chemist might call this a thiol because it's containing sulfur. And so sulfhydryl is a more, more appropriate modern uh, name for this molecule. But what's fascinating about it is the SH is very similar to the hydroxyl. It, it, it's a polar covalent bond right there, and so therefore it has a tendency to hydrogen bond with water. And so that's one thing, that it's polar, okay, sulfhydryl. But there's something more significant about just it being polar, okay? And I want to emphasize this. What's fascinating, fascinating about it is that in certain environmental conditions, if you have uh, an oxidizing agent, in other words, something that's going to cause something to lose electrons, what can occur in a, if there's a sulfhydryl is that the hydrogen will jump off and what will happen is the sulfurs can form a covalent bond with adjacent sulfurs in a, in a, in a chain. And so let me, let me give you an example of that. It seems a little obscure. In, in, as you, if you're reading this, you'll see that sometimes sulfur is important in terms of holding hair together, whether it be straight hair or curly hair, but it's also very critical in stabilizing protein structure. And so I just want to emphasize the, the critical nature of the sulfhydryl. And so first off, you know, do you remember that these little uh, points right here represent carbons right here? And so here's the parent chain, here's the hydroxyl group, here's the sulfhydryl group like this, okay, so there, there's the thiol. Here's the thiol, here's the thiol. Okay, so we have that, but what I'm getting at is this. This orange line represents a chain of amino acids. Let's go here, red. 
So if this is a chain of amino acids, and, and these are the R groups that are sticking out, what's interesting about these R groups of amino acids is depending on what they are, it'll help the protein uh, fold in its proper functioning shape. And so if you had an amino acid that had, and this is the example of the amino acid, if you had an amino acid that's R group was a sulfhydryl, which is what cysteine is, it's the only amino acid out of 20, and this is not a detail, this is rather important, I just want to emphasize it. It's the one amino acid out of the 20 that actually contains sulfur. So proteins, I'm going to just go right out and write this out. So proteins contain the element sulfur. That's critical. And you're like, well, why is it? Well, as it turns out, the sulfur from one R group, sulfhydryl, could link up with the sulfhydryl from another R group of another amino acid if it's in the right spot in terms of the uh, sequence. And what will form is what we call a disulfide, because there's two sulfurs, a disulfite bridge. N these are covalent bonds, of course, right here. These are all covalent bonds. And so the significance of this is that it holds the protein in this particular conformation. So these sulfur bridges, sulfur bridges, hold proteins together. So that sulfhydryl is rather important. Let me give you a real example of that. A real example of that is human insulin. It's a hormone, as you probably have heard of it before, that's produced in the pancreas. It's critical. It's produced uh, by these little islands in the pancreas called islets of Langerhans, and they're produced by these beta cells. And what do these beta cells do? They produce these, the, these two polypeptide chains, but the, these two polypeptide chains are linked together, forming the structure of human insulin. And how they're linked together is with a sulfur bridge. Cysteine, right here, has a disulfite bridge there, and here's a disulfite bridge here. So it's interesting, it's within the chain, and then here is between the chains, and then here is between the chains. So you have disulfite, three disulfite bridges holding the structure of human insulin together, and that's critical because human insulin has to have this shape in order for it to function as a hormone, which is, that is, to reduce blood sugar level and help your cells to absorb sugar. So it lowers blood sugar. As it relates to hair, you know, whether your hair, <laughs> whether your hair is straight or wavy, it actually can be changed. You could turn your wavy hair straight or turn your straight hair wavy. And the way you would do that is this green line represents the protein keratin. And as it turns out, you've got these sulfhydryl functional groups sticking out of this, uh, of your, of your protein. And if you add an oxidizing agent, if you go to the hair salon, and they'll, they can wrap your hair up, whether it be in big curls for a light wave or real tight curls for a, for a tight wave, and then add an oxidizing agent, and it'll build these disulfite bridges, and then or it'll rinse, and then your hair is permanently like this. Eh, not necessarily permanently. When the hair grows out, it'll form its, its native conformation, but it's pretty pretty interesting that we are able to do that. So again, closing the book on the sulfhydryl, it forms the cysteine amino acids can form disulfite bridges which hold proteins together in their unique ways. What's interesting is if that amino acid wasn't in that location, if this guy was like way over here, then that wouldn't form. You, you do have to be close. So ultimately it's the sequence of amino acids which is rather significant in order for these uh, cross bridges to function. And then another really important, everyone's really important, another functional group that's really critical in biology is this phosphate group. And the phosphate's kind of cool. It's got an oxygen coming off the R group of the parent chain of hydrocarbons. So you got this, da, da, da. you got these carbons coming out like this. And then here is the functional group. The functional group is an oxygen, phosphorus, double bond oxygen, and two oxygens with negative charge. So it's negatively charged. It has a strong negative charge. And do you see this, how it's like a phosphorus with a halo? 
a halo of oxygen. And sometimes in biology, we can take a shortcut and say, all right, here's the R group and here's the phosphate. I'm going to represent it with a P with a circle around it. And so that P with the circle around it represents the fact that there's four oxygens that are surrounding it and it has a negative two charge. Sometimes that's not even written because it's understood. You might, might have a memory for this. And so phosphates are really, really important. And, and when you say organic phosphate, it means that it's connected to a hydrocarbon. And so here's glycerol, glycerol phosphate. Here's three carbons uh, with alcohol is glycerol, but the last alcohol has been replaced by a phosphate functional group. So this is glycerol phosphate. Kind of interesting. You're like, okay, give me an example of why uh, phosphates are important. Well, they're critical because they're found in really important molecules, like they're found in nucleic acids, you may recall that, sugar phosphate base. They're also found in an, a critical energy molecule that cells use called adenosine triphosphate. And they're also very importantly found in one of the main lipids that composes the structure of all cell membranes, which are phospholipids. The name phospho has to do with phosphate, and it, you may recall it. Here's a picture. The phospholipid starts off with a glycerol, two fatty acid chains, right here. If you had a third fatty acid, it would be a triglyceride. But if you attach this, this negatively charged phosphate to the glycerol, this is what you get. Like we, when we symbolize this, we kind of go like this. We put a circle and we put these chains like this, representing the fatty acid chains, like this. and then. You may recall this, we say, hey, this is polar, hey, this is nonpolar over on this side. And so its polarity has to do with the fact this is negatively charged. You see that right there? So this is the phosphate head, and these are the nonpolar tails over here. So phospholipids, and you're like, yeah, yeah, this is really important because the phospholipid, this part is polar. It's polar because that negative charge is very attractive to water. And these, this area right here is nonpolar, all right, over there. And you're like, well, what's the significance of the phospholipid? The phospholipid is a main component of the bilayer. And I say bilayer of the cell membrane because you have to have these, that polar phosphate group on the outside, which is in contact with the extracellular on the outside uh, solution which is aqueous with water so this is where the water is out here and then on the inside of the cell let me just complete the cell the inside of the cell which is the cytosol or the cytoplasma um, that's also an aqueous solution as well and so those phosphate groups have to be here in contact with both the water on the outside and on the inside so that's really important it has to do with phosphate and then this this is potentially one of the most important molecules we, we even have in biology, adenosine triphosphate. So adenosine, it's the adenine with the, the sugar ribose, but there's triphosphate, meaning that there's three phosphates. It, now, there is such a thing as adenosine monophosphate, and that would just be one, so adenosine monophosphate. And then if you had two, it would be adenosine diphosphate. And if you have three, it'd be, guess, adenosine triphosphate. And so if there's three phosphates. The thing about this though is, you know, the phosphates are all important and everything, but boy, they, they do not like being next to each other like this. Can you guess why? They really don't like it. It's sort of like twins or triplets even. Triplets share in a room. Oh. So all this negative charge, they want to repel each other. And so interestingly enough, it's very easy to hydrolyze with water to break this bond and this is released. So you can go from ATP to ADP very easily. But it's not easy to go from ADP. Now, if you went from ADP, you needed to add a phosphate. Let's go a little sub I for inorganic, meaning it's not connected to a, an organic uh, molecule. So ADP, ADP plus a phosphate equals ATP. That requires a tremendous amount of energy to make ATP. Where do you suppose we're getting all that energy to make ATP? From food. This is why we eat food to make ATP. And then when the ATP then loses its phosphate, and when it loses its phosphate, 
here's ATP losing its phosphate, that since that's negatively charged, I could stick that onto some big organic molecule. And when I stick that on there, this is going to ultimately uh, be affected. And if I stick that's a negative charge, it'd be like sticking a, uh, a thumbtack in, in your side. It would cause you to jolt a little bit, so it'll change the shape. This is huge. Phosphates can cause proteins to change shape, which enables them to do work. And so this is a very critical, very critical functional group. And again, here it is. ATP, if we want, if I want my muscles to contract, ultimately the reason that it's contracting is that the protein's getting shorter because ATP is releasing one of its phosphates and that inorganic phosphate is sticking on my muscle protein and causing it to to change shape, which is ultimately resulting in it to pulling on the tendon on the bone, and then I have, I have motion. So that's really cool. So I also wanted to point out the fact, I alluded to this before, that when an amino group is in the right um, environment, it's capable of acting as a base, meaning it can pick up a proton, and if in so doing, it forms and an, uh, an ionizes into NH3+. Plus. And then also this carboxylic acid, it can also donate a proton and also ionize, COO minus. Do you see that right over here? Sometimes, here's an amino acid, sometimes in, in, if you're in like neutral pH, there's a tendency for the amino acid to, to both have the positive ion on the amino group and the negative ion at the same time. If you have a molecule that has both positive and negative ions, it's considered to be a Switzer ion, Switzer ion. So it, it has, it's, this amino acid is depicted as both the cation and the anion. That's kind of interesting. And so here's, here's a, an amino acid that's non-Switzer. Here's one that's Switzer. In other words, it has um, the ionization here and over here as well. And then finally, the last, the last uh, functional group is called a methyl. And it may seem like insignificant compared to the other ones. It's just a simply a carbon with three hydrogens off of it. And I'll draw it right here, CH3. So you stick that onto the R group and you have a methyl. And it, you can have two methyls or three methyls. And here's, um, here's a ringed structure with a methyl group coming off of it. Well, what's really important about this is when you add methyl groups, let me give you two <laughs> critical examples of this. And I'll start first by saying bacteria sometimes will attach methyl groups onto their DNA, onto their single chromosome ring, to prevent enzymes from digesting it. They have digestive enzymes called restriction endonucleases, which fight off uh, viruses that are trying to attack them. And if the restriction enzyme reaches a methyl group, it won't cut the DNA. And these enzymes cut, therefore, only foreign DNA. So that's fairly significant. These methyl groups protect DNA in bacteria. But what we found more recently is that, here's a methyl group, is that even eukaryotic cells use the attachment of methyls onto DNA, and in, and in particular, cytosine. It's called DNA methylization. And a whole new branch of genetics is emerging uh, called epigenetics. Because what we can see is in epigenetics is it's the study of gene expression and the change in cellular phenotype that isn't having to do with a change in the nucleotide sequence, but rather when cells can affect gene expression by adding methyl groups to DNA. So in other words, they can turn genes on or off this way. So gene expression is affected by that and also histone modification. So methylization and, D and histone modification are, are branches of epigenetics. And it's called epi because it's sort of on top of the fact that, uh, that the sequence is not as important. It's very important, but there's other effects to uh, phenotype. So methylization. So I hope you enjoyed that look at functional groups, all the various functional groups, what they look like. 
I hope you can remember their structure and some of their unique properties and some of the important uh, molecules that possess them. So hope you enjoyed that and thanks for watching.